Last time we spoke about the budgetary process. Today we want to uh, look at some uh, numbers uh, to illustrate the idea of flexible versus fixed budgets. Fixed budgets, of course, would be the idea of setting up a budget for the year and not altering it uh, afterwards and, and just using it throughout the year. Now, this has uh, certain limitations in terms of usefulness of the product of the budget because uh, things uh, oftentimes don't work out as planned. One may sell, for example, in the course of the year, a far higher volume of goods than the one originally anticipated or had budgeted for, or something far less. Let's look at this uh, with some numbers. Let's say we have a company producing office equipment and their budget calls for output of a thousand units for the coming year. And here are the costs, materials, labor, and fixed overheads. Very simple sort of a cost calculation. What do you suppose the company would um, do if after three months they see that the sales are running 20% higher than originally projected? In other words, that instead of um, working on the level of 1,000 units, we're really talking about 1,200 units. And this is already known after three months. Does it make sense for the company to continue to operate against a budget based on 1,000 units for the remaining nine months of the year? It seems quite artificial. What the company can do is say, if we had known at the beginning of the year that we would be operating at a level of 1,200, why not go ahead and set up or re-modify uh, our budgets so that we reflect that reality. In other words, at the end of the first quarter, the company could um, use a flexible budget to put together what the costs would be associated with a level of output of 1,200 units. One can see here, for example, that the materials costs are directly associated with the number of outputs. The output level went up by 20%. And the materials costs have, in fact, gone up as well by 20%. The labor costs, however, have not gone up by 20%. They've gone from 200,000 to 225,000. This represents an e increase of 12.5%. Now, this is a good place to stop and think about how are the labor costs behaving with an increase in output? What's going on here? Why are labor costs growing uh, percentage-wise less than the increase of uh, output? If you think back to one of the earlier sessions of this paper, you will recall that whereas the uh, materials costs in this case are directly um, uh, variable costs and they move to in direct proportion with the level of output, the labor costs in, in, in this particular case uh, seem to betray some kind of mixed cost behavior. In other words, there is a fixed cost element and a variable cost element in these, uh, in these numbers. Now, let us try to understand what uh, how to measure the increase in labor costs and to explain them. We could say, for example, that in going from 1,000 to 1,200 units, i.e. an increase of 200 units, we see that the labor costs have gone up from $200,000 to 225000 This is a $25,000 increase uh, for an increase in number of units of 200. If we divide 25,000 by 200, we will arrive at 125. And this number is interpreted as the variable cost of labor, $125 per unit. Again, for every unit increase in output, labor costs go up by $125. Now, having discovered the variable costs, we can work backwards and figure out what the fixed costs have to be. 
and explain the fixed costs in our labor costs. We can do this by saying that our total labor costs of $225,000 is equivalent to variable costs of $125 times the level of output, 1,200. That's the level of output associated with total labor costs. And we know that each labor excuse me, that each unit of uh, output has $125 of variable cost associated with this. If we multiply this together, it's always useful to have a calculator on hand. That gives us $150,000 of variable costs. Therefore, the difference between 150000 and 225000 must be the fixed cost element of $75,000. One can verify, in fact, that this is correct by looking at the output level that was uh, previously asserted. When we had an output of 1,000 units, we had labor costs of totaling $200,000. Let's break this up and just test our conclusions that we took below. Uh, $200,000 worth of labor presumably is broken down into variable costs of $125 per unit, and we're talking about 1,000 units. And to this we should add what are presumed to be fixed labor costs of $75,000. Multiply that through, and yes, it adds up to $200,000, so it is in fact correct. Now, why are we doing this analysis? Because it gives us a great deal of um, power now if we understand how labor costs um, vary with different levels of output. If, for example, we need to prepare a flex budget for an output level, of 1,075 units. Well, we know what the costs are associated with 1,000 units and 1,200 units. We can calculate the costs associated with 1,075 units by using the, effectively the formula that we have designed here. The costs should be variable costs of labor I'm focusing on the labor element now, $125 per unit times 1075 plus $75,000 of fixed labor costs. That doesn't change. This will give us a total of $209. $1,375 uh, as the cost of labor associated with an output of 1,075 units. The materials, we know what the materials costs are going to be. The materials costs will be $75 worth of materials per unit times 1,075 units. That will be $80,625. So we have our labor, 209,000 materials, 80,625,000. Know, 80, and of course, the fixed overheads, they remain at 100,000. They haven't changed. So if we add those three numbers together, we effectively come up with our total production costs associated with an output level of 1,075 units. There remains now to uh, have a look at uh, variance analysis. Now, the variance analysis, this is a, uh, as the name suggests, it's to track the way in which actual performance differs from 
budgeted performance. <laughs> if, for example, in the previous example, we uh, had originally budgeted 1,000 units and our actual output was higher, 1,075 units, and actual labor costs turn out to be $205,000, then we could say, we could look at the labor costs from a variant point of view and reason as follows. The original budget labor costs were $200,000 and the actual labor costs was $205,000. We could say in a very simplistic fashion that we have spent $5,000 more than originally budgeted on labor and that this is considered to be a bad thing. Let's call this adverse. However, keep in mind that the actual output achieved was higher than what was pre originally budgeted and that is a good thing and therefore we would expect to have had higher labor costs because our output level in fact was higher than budgeted. So how do we really measure whether our variance is good or bad? What we can do is we can say that if we had known and budgeted for 1075 units of output, then our flexed or budgeted labor costs would have been 209,000 at a level of 1,075 units. That would have been the expectation. And therefore, the actual labor costs achieved are actually less than 209,000. In fact, we beat the flexed budget, uh, uh, the expected labor cost, by $4,375. It's actually a favorable variance. B is actually a more sophisticated and relevant way to calculate the variance of the foregoing situation. A we can discard as being simplistic and actually misleading um, management in terms of conclusions to be drawn from uh, variance analysis. Now variance analysis is a uh, fascinating area of uh, analysis. It's not uh, purely a number crunching exercise. It's very important to be able to understand what's going on inside uh, a company in order to understand how costs behave and why the variances are occurring. It's almost like detective work. If we look at, for example, material price variances, we could say that the, we could have favorable Variances where we pay less for the materials because we have discounts received or our purchasing manager is particularly skilled at uh, negotiation uh, prices. However, keep in mind there could be other reasons why we have a favorable material price variance. Suppose the purchasing manager had bought poor quality materials and he got a good price on that. He on a price basis alone, those materials being cheaper would show up as a favorable variance in the budgets. However, let's look down further at another type of variance and what the impact could be of using substandard materials. Material usage uh, variance refers to how much material you use for a product. And normally there are standards, pre-specified standards as to how much materials are expected to be used. For example, tons of steel in a car or amount of plastic that would be used for producing a calculator or a laptop. And to the extent that more material is used than budgeted, that would result in a material usage adverse variance. Now, we could say that the adverse variance may happen because people are wasteful in the production practice uh, in their production habits and therefore uh, are not paying as much care to uh, to to save and economize on materials but it could also be because substandard materials were purchased we have to use more of it 
in order to achieve a given level of output. So what we can see here is that a uh, action taken by the purchasing manager here to achieve a favorable material price variance actually has a negative effect producing a material usage adverse variance at the production level. One can reason in the same way to examine whether labor is operating efficiently or not based on uh, how fast they work, how qualified they are, uh, whether one has bought very cheap labor so that one has favorable labor rate, that's uh, uh, labor wage variances, in other words, buying very cheap workers, low pay rates, but their efficiency may suffer and therefore we may end up with adverse um, labor efficiency variances.